Kia and welcome to the Niche Cast. This is your boom. Diggity do the Doc Mr. Slippers, the Papatoi Panther, here with the one and only Wobbly Wildcard. And we are here today to talk through some Wellington Phoenix business. And then we also have the big bout between one Joseph Parker and another go, another bloke by the name of Junior Fa, which is going to be pretty exciting. We Early in the week, we record the Niche Cage Variety Show, so check that out for a, a, a hard and fast, broad-spectrum look at Kiwi Sporting Matters. Uh, tomorrow, on Friday, we will be dropping another email banger. Mondays and Fridays, they come out with all, all sorts of Kiwi sports goodness. And, of course, we're always writing about sport at theniche-cache.com. And if you do love what we're doing, feel free to support us however you want to support us. The best way uh, is usually on Patreon. It's just straight up the guts. And we record a, a little podcast for our patrons as well prior to the variety show. So it's a, just a beautiful, wholesome thingy magic wobbly wildcard to for to yourself yeah how's it going um nicely well stocked for for stuff to talk about today it seems we are indeed we there is some uh a little bit of housekeeping because um i just want to chuck up the fact that stephen adams doesn't appear to be playing at the moment he's injured correct wildcard yeah he's missed um Oh, they're playing later this afternoon um, before publish of the podcast, but after recording of the podcast. Uh, so I, oh, I, at this stage, I doubt he'll play that one. I, I don't think it's been like a a full on like where like timeline or anything revealed, but he fell on his ankle pretty bad in a game against uh, Portland. I think it was um, old mate Ennis Cantor was right there next to him and he didn't even like um, he just like going up for a rebound, landed bad on his ankle, and he just was like straight up and hobbling down the um, down the what do you call him like down towards the like the t- through the tunnel towards the dressing room, and he actually threw a chair while he was on his way there. So you know he was in a fair bit of pain. If Stephen Adams is that level of frustrated, so um, he's missed I think two games, two maybe three games since then, uh, including mo- the rest of that one because that was in the like late first quarter. So yeah, it might be a might be a couple more games before we see him again. The Pelicans they won four games in a row, and then lost three games in a row, and then won a game, and then they lost that Portland game. Um, and since then they did have a lovely come from behind win over Boston, which Stephen Adams wasn't playing in. So we will touch back base with the new orleans pelicans when old big old stevie adams is playing some basketball and i also just want to shout out to people that lydia co is playing uh this weekend at the gamebridge lpga uh tournament in the lpga this is the first i think appearance for lydia co this year so it'll be good to start that off in Gamebridge, which is apparently that is in Orlando, Florida. So I'll be keeping a close eye on that. And of course, just like what's on the menu, we've got Black Caps playing T20 International Cricket against Australia. We've got the White Ferns um, losing every game they play in ODI Cricket, which is great. And they will, they're will they playing against England. We've got NRL trials. Obviously, your football beat's pretty crazy. And then we've also got... Um, What's your vibe on the breakers right now? Still quite niggly? <laughs> um, yeah, niggly is probably a good word for it. Lamar Patterson's just been ruled out for, I think, four to six weeks with a knee injury. So, um, well, what was I think it was on the Variety Show, eh? I was mentioned, or it might have been another podcast, I can't remember, that it was about this point last season in a similar position of, you know, guys being injured, other guys underperforming, team losing a lot of games, um, hopes of making the playoffs starting to look very slim. And yeah, right about that point where they signed Glenn Rice Jr. last season, and that was probably the nadir of everything. Like that only made things a whole lot worse. So we'll see how they respond this time, if lessons have been learnt or not. I did watch, I think it was that Illawarra game. It was on at the same time as the Black Caps. So I was flicking between those, and um, old mate Patterson doesn't look to be a great signing <laughs> i was watching him and he can uh 
yeah, just not overly inspiring, let's just say that. So the Breakers are in a little rough patch. Whiteburn's ODI team's in a rough patch. Um, big things happening in the UFC as well. We've got Israel Asanya. Um, he's got a big title fight coming up. NRL's getting pretty hot at the moment, so there's a lot of shit happening. And we are going to put the focus on the Wellington Phoenix and the boxing. Joseph Parker versus Junior Fa. That is the most relevant shit right now. Now, 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 now. The Wellington Phoenix, they are dead last wildcard in the A-League. They have played eight games, and they have won one of those games, and they have lost five, drawn two. Um, and uh, I, from what I gather, in watching bits and pieces, and then um, peeping insight to what you do, you're tweeting all through the Wellington Phoenix games on Twitter, so check that out, and obviously you write about it as well. Um... The Wellington Phoenix are one of three teams, one of four teams, not to score 10 goals this season. So they're scoring less than 10 goals. And you've got this, like, you've, a big thing for you has been the lack of goals for the Wellington Phoenix. But Melbourne Victory have scored less goals than the Wellington Phoenix. And then Melbourne City has scored nine goals. Newcastle Jets are in sixth and they've only scored eight goals. So how does, how are you processing that? You're... I'm, from what you're saying, it seems like the Wellington Phoenix have this, like, inability to score goals, yet other teams are being successful with the same amount of goals. Like, of course, the best team in the A-League is the Central Coast Mariners. They've got bloody 16 goals, so that makes a lot of sense. But is that a is that the biggest issue for the Wellington Phoenix right now? Is there lack of goals? Is it a case of they're creating so many chances that they look quite good, but they can't convert those chances to goals. And that's, so it's kind of respectable that they've still found eight goals out of this. Like, how do you uh, digest that lack of goals and that specific issue with this Wellington Phoenix team? One more note on that. They did change their main striker recently, didn't they? They chucked Ben Wayne up top. And is that, how does that fit into this uh, lack of goals and lack of uh, maybe killer instinct in the attacking third. Yeah, um, all in to start with. Uh, that's the Central Coast Mariners, by the way, also the only team that the Phoenix have beaten, which is a little bit weird. Lose to the bottom team on the table, become the bottom team on the table, but having beaten the top team at one point. Um, I think the difference between... The Phoenix not scoring goals and some of those other teams not scoring goals is that the, the those other teams also don't concede too many, whereas the Phoenix just don't seem to be able to... They weren't very good at keeping clean sheets last season either, and their defense has gotten worse. So instead of being a team that is trying to grind out 2-1 wins, and it's pretty fine margins when you're in that kind of area, um, they're a team who is losing 2-1, you know... You, you score one fewer chance per game on average, you concede one more goal per game on average, wins become losses. Um, I do have a like a theory about this a little bit that I want to ask you later on, but we'll come back around to that because it's you know not immediately relevant. But they're yeah, just not having Steven Taylor and not being able to replace Steven Taylor was such a hammer blow to this team, and it felt like that at the time. Um, you get Luke Devere coming in and Josh Laws. Luke Devere, who had a very good season last time. He's easily the most pedigreed defender left on the roster. Um, but a guy who's had injury worries throughout his career, and that's why the Phoenix were able to first place, because he had been you know, released from, I think it might have been Brisbane, um, because they didn't trust him to stay fit. He had a healthy season for the majority of it, but then he got injured and missed the um, playoff game, and they lost that, so that wasn't ideal. Um, he's just got busted again for like, I think he's out for about I think it's like three months, potentially. He's going to miss the bulk of the season now with injury. Um, wasn't playing particularly great already. I think there was a bit of a, there's a bit of a, um, what would you call it? Like just the dynamic of the way they were defending. Um, a lot of football is about teamwork and 
um within teamwork you get like combinations so you get like winger and fullback working together two strikers working together central midfielders how they complement each other and they might be two excellent players but if they don't have that combination you're not getting like that kind of um I, I, what the smart people would call synergy and, and that kind of thing. Like they're not better than the sum of their parts. Um, and central defense, I think is probably the area where that is the most notable. And last year you had Luke Devere being able to play the secondary partner to Steven Taylor, who is very like front foot, um, you know, very aggressive. He's going to come out, he's going to win the ball. He's going to demand it. He's going to um, tell everybody else where they've got to be very vocal guy, inspirational sort of leader on the field in a number of ways. He's not there suddenly. Devere steps into that more senior role in the defense, and he's just not that same kind of personality. And I think there was a kind of, especially when you also had him play next to Josh Laws, who is um, a midfielder slash defense. Um, he's not, he's got a good left foot, which is one of the reasons why he, it's, was, you know, why he started there. Um, Probably his passing range as well helped, uh, just having another ball player at the back to help build up possessions. Um, maybe not the best combination, though, to have a, a sort of... Um, I won't say he, he was out of position because he's played there enough to know what he's doing, but he is a versatile player who's not necessarily a specialist in that role with a guy like Devere who was... was coming off a season where he played very well as the secondary dude. And maybe there was just a little lack of uh, leadership or, um, you know, just that combination in general between those two. And it wasn't going great, but then when they both got injured, everything got worse. So the backups weren't, um, weren't great either. And it's just like, I'm a bit surprised we haven't seen a little more of um, Te Arafai hudson Wehongi because I thought he did quite well late last season in opportunities. We have seen Tim Payne converted to centre back these last two games. I think Payne's actually done quite well. I, there, there's risks to having him there. Like he he won a premiership title with Eastern Suburbs playing as a centre back, but I can also vividly remember remember him like getting red cards, um, giving away penalties. He's a risky player, um, but I think they just because he's probably the only one of these guys who can do that front foot defending thing. I think they kind of need him so they're not just sitting back and absorbing more pressure than they can handle. Um, I think the the one of the things I tweeted during the last game is uh, the pros outweigh the cons right now with Tim Payne at, at centre back, particularly when Louis Fenton's done fairly well playing at right back as well. Um, Liam McGing did not have a good game against Melbourne Victory with him. I thought he was borderline kind of bad. You can see why he played because he's tall. He can get up for those like Melbourne Victory were obviously going to play um, a direct aerial threat with Rudy just did. Uh, just. McGing's tall he's tall enough to get up and win a few of those headers but he also gave away two stupid corners and they scored from both of them so um those kind of mistakes get punished that's one thing if he's talked about is this is a team who seems to not be able to finish their chances and then concede silly goals at the same time you combine those two things it's not a not a good picture so I've spent all this time just spent five minutes talking about the defense based on a question about the lack of goal scoring but I think those two things go hand in hand I think when you um, switch up the balance in the team and weaknesses at the back have exposed a sort of lack of efficiency, I think you could say, up, up front. Um, ben Wayne has been getting a run. The last, like the last two games he's gotten a go, he, that was good. He played 90 minutes both times. He played well enough um, within not so great performances. Um, at, what, that, you know, at times, very good. Like the last half hour against Melbourne Victor, I thought they were all over them. They just didn't get the chances to fall and so it goes, they've been like that. They have spells of dominance, spells where they just don't look like they can create anything. It's um, they, they fluctuate throughout games. It's just a matter of making that. And that's like, there's nothing wrong with that. You just got to make hay while the sun shines, score your goals while you're on top. Um, they haven't been doing that. One of the reasons, like, I mean, the reason why Ben Wayne has been getting that opportunity um, alongside Mirza Muradovic as well, a young Australian striker. He's about 20, 21, a um, little bit older than Ben Wayne. The reason those two have been playing up front is because Tommy Hemed, the Israeli um, import forward that they scored to replace Gary Hooper to hopefully score them heaps of goals. He's currently injured, hopefully not for too much longer. David Ball got a red card the other day. He's missed two games. That was his second game last night. So he's back next game. Um, therefore, we'll see how much longer uh, Wayne and Muradovic last, but they didn't really do a lot of goal scoring um, with those two anyway. It's 
it's a yeah it's a matter of balance i think and it's when things are just knocked slightly off kilter every you just you know that um uh it's like one of those cliche type cartoony things you've got the leaky boat and then you plug one thing and then it, that causes pressure somewhere else which bursts another leak and like, it's that kind of picture that it has been with the wellington phoenix lately where um a like one issue leads to another issue leads to another issue and they're all related and they're all sort of making each other worse at the moment and they're just a probably a team a little bit low on confidence because of that and playing away from home and not winning games very often it it takes a toll um and that's kind of what we've been looking at but the margins are close enough that they do feel still like a team where you get a couple of them to fly into the top corner and suddenly it'd look like a different story because they've played they've had periods within all of these games where they've played well they just got to start you know just got to start cashing in in those moments basically all right i've got some i've got some questions here just to help set set the scene with wellington phoenix and these can just be you know a bit quicker rapid fire who is your favorite player with the wellington phoenix this season Ooh, I mean, there's players who, there's quite a lot of players who I really enjoy watching within this team. Like they, they are an enjoyable team. Um, a lot of very handy signings that have turned up there. Um, good core of Kiwi players and a couple academy players as well, which is always enjoyable. But I mean, just even when they've been playing terribly, I'm still watching these games and thinking like, Ulysses Davia is unbelievable like he is just a class above everyone else on the pitch he's so good um like just his this is his second season there i don't imports don't tend to stay that long generally you don't necessarily expect um someone to do a poor rifle and just like i like this club i'm gonna stay in this country for the rest of my life kind of kind of scenario i'm gonna set myself up well beyond football here um so i don't know how much you can like overreact or just react or whatever to like these kind of situations but i'm watching him and thinking like just in terms of sheer ability and influence on the field like i can't think of too many other players that the phoenix have ever had who have been on this level like he is so good to watch he's an amazing player wish they had a little bit uh more finishing and just a few more alternate um sort of creative outlets around him they have those players who can do that they just haven't been producing that yet so there is a lot of pressure on davia to to do all that but i mean of everyone in the team he is he's getting the most support at the moment because he's got the mexican fan club there every mexican in sydney's been turning up to um watch those phoenix like um inverted comma home games there is very like one dude even had a saxophone the other day how good's that so um i'm glad he's getting recognized there i'm glad he's getting a bit of the a bit of the you know Got a couple hundred people there cheering him on as he goes because he he certainly deserves it. You kind of hinted at this, but there is reason for optimism that like maybe things at some stage things might click into gear. Do you see anything with how they're playing? Um, their the formation is put out for their starting eleven, so I'm not sure you can adjust this. Um, as you see fit but they is it the four two three one formation is that like a generally the theme of how they play play footy and then are there any adjustments that you can see that might help them other other than like players coming back from injury and that sort of stuff are there any like playing style elements or playing formation elements that might help them out in that sense well, funny you should say that because the the four two three one thing has popped up the last two games, and that's not been how they've played. I, I don't know why they've done that. If it's just smoke and mirrors, like let's make them think we're doing something a little bit different here. Um, they generally play four at the back, two sort of box to boxy type midfield, or not quite. That I wouldn't call actually. I wouldn't call either of them box to box midfielders, but two sort of number eights, I guess. Um, and then a wide playmaker um, on each side and then two strikers up front. That's been how they've played all season. That's how they played most of the time last season, but with little varieties and whatnot. I actually, when they first tweeted out the uh, the, the 
team in that formation and the club, you know, media graphics, whatever, I I was kind of, like, you know, pretty intrigued by that. I actually think maybe that is the kind of thing that might work very nicely for them. Um, you get Davia in a central playmaking role. You still have wingers. You only get the one striker, and I don't know that that's really uh, Ben Wayne or Mirza Muradovic's uh, bag, I think. Both of them would prefer to be able to play, um, it w- you know, with another striker, so that they're not expected to play with their backs to goal or anything like that. Um, when Tommy Hemed comes back, however, someone who is quite big and physical, I think maybe that's a an aspect they could try. It would mean David Ball having to play out on the wing or maybe even off the bench. So I don't know how that goes. Or maybe Ball he plays up front and Hemed has to work his way back in. I don't know because he wasn't in the best of form yet. He's still sort of adapting to the to the club having turned up late and to do the quarantine stuff and whatnot. So we'll see if that's something that they're considering a change, not a drastic change in formation or anything, but some little tweaks probably would be overdue just to shake things up, just to put something like inject something new into the mixture and, and get this team trying to um, win some games again, basically. And is there any, any younger player out like, Obviously, Ben Ben Wayne is someone who springs to mind. Maybe McGarry at left back as well, who is a bit of a he's like a rugged live wire. Are there any young players that have really caught your eye in small sample size? So maybe not the dudes who are starting games, but like guys in the wider squad, especially coming off the bench. Is is there any like just forecasting forward? Are there any individuals we should keep an eye on? like this dude? is playing we need to watch him because he's a really talented young prospect in the Wellington Phoenix system well the the main guy who fits that other like other than Ben Wayne who has played a couple you know has started the last couple games in a row and a few other guys you could say like McGarry is one McGing as well um there's a few who and Muradovic like there's a few who have been getting games so probably don't fall into that category I think the next one off the rank would be Sam Sutton, who's been in a few squads but hasn't actually played yet this season. He did make a debut last season. He's a extremely talented midfielder, a guy I really enjoyed watching when he was playing reserve football in the Premiership, and a guy who certainly has the ability to to be a you know have a long career at the Phoenix. There, um, leadership capabilities as well, like good ball player. He works hard. He can win the ball back in midfield as well. Um, at this stage, don't think you'd get to see him in this in a sort of cam devlin role um maybe that's something down the line when that he could like be targeted for i think at the moment you see him playing more as a wide attacking midfielder or as a backup fullback and because there's a bit of depth in those roles i don't think there's really been the opportunities for him yet but sam sudden for sure is one um what's interesting is that the premiership finishes this weekend the wellington phoenix um aren't allowed to play in the semi-finals anyway. Um, but even if they were, they're not going to make it. They're probably going to finish last on the table, though they've been you know, pretty competitive for most of the season. There are, like, that does free up a few of those guys. Um, if they did want to take advantage, for example, of a travel bubble to Australia, um, which I'm not sure is active at the moment because of our uh, more recent couple of cases and Australia being weird and overreacting to that, worse than, <laughs> worse than like... <laughs> Seems things are a little more under control. Shout out to Papatoitoi High School, by the way. Um, I like that could free up a couple of those dudes to like Ben Old is the standout player from that team. Um, creative midfielder, great left foot. Um, he maybe goes over and joins the team for the rest of the A League season. Um, Curtis Mogg might be another one, the captain of that team, big centre back. Um, Finn Sermon's impressed as well, another tall, uh, lankier centre back, good height for his age. Um, or maybe an Adam Hillis. I don't know as well about oh, Riley Bedwire has been scoring a few goals too. He might be someone who could benefit from just going, even if these dudes are just training with the first team for a few months, filling out the numbers, you know, it's still an advance in their careers to be able to do that. So I don't know as well, because there are sort of half a dozen LA Academy guys within that Phoenix group. I don't know if they're just sort of effectively on loan for the premiership season or if they can go over and be um, Phoenix youth team members without having to sign to the like first team thing because you can just call up academy players you don't have to sign them or anything they're they're part of your wider club so i don't know about guys like jalen rodwell or 
um, etc. It's that might be so. Like I, so he would be a player for sure with his versatility. You could send over. There's a couple others as well. Oliver Van Rysel, um, Alex Clayton, etc. But I don't know if they're able to go. But yeah, like Ben Old for sure would be someone who. If anyone is going, to, and maybe they're not, like maybe this isn't something they're thinking of. They're just rather like you guys go play club football and and get your reps in. Um, but if anyone is going over, Ben Old for sure would be one of them. Beauty, do you? So just to wrap up that Wellington Phoenix, but there, do you? Do you have serious optimism? I wouldn't call it serious, but I mean it's still early enough in the season that this team, who have been streaky. For the last couple of years, this is not out of the wheelhouse for them. They generally start poorly, and then they'll go on a you know big unbeaten streak or whatever. I think there's um, there's you know there's enough belief that if a couple of things start going their way, they could get on a roll and and do good things though. It makes for an interesting like little comparison because you got the Breakers and the Wellington Phoenix who have had horrible starts to their respective competitions in you know, while being based in Australia. And it was very similar to, well, it wasn't similar to the Warriors because the Warriors sucked before COVID came. And then, like, it was just a grind, understandably, given their circumstance and scenario they found themselves in being based in Australia after the, the period where the NRL was suspended. There's like a, we've talked about it a bit, but there is this, like, idea narrative where the Warriors are going to suck because look at what the Breakers have done. Look at what the Wellington Phoenix have done. And speaking of serious optimism, I am seriously optimistic that the Warriors are going to have a very different NRL campaign this year compared to how the Wellington Phoenix and New Zealand Breakers have started their ca- their campaigns and their competitions, um, which I think is based off... There's a lot... There's very fresh energy at the Warriors. That's one thing, you know, a lot of new staff, a lot of new players, and a whole lot more preparation, a whole lot more common sense in the logistics, um, in having your the families around and more resource put in to support the players in that sense. And I think it's, I believe it's, uh, I think it's kind of apples and oranges because on the one hand, you've got the Phoenix and the Breakers who... There were a lot of, you know, um, there was uncertainty in many different small areas and in the preparation for their um, competitions. You know, are we going to do this? Are we going to do that? Are we going to have this many players, that many players? How's it all going to work? And I think the Warriors just have experience with everything. And I think it's that's where the, the serious optimism comes in for the Warriors, even though... You know, the situation is the same. All three teams are New Zealand teams, usually based out of New Zealand, play home games in New Zealand, and now they are all based in Australia competing against all those Australian teams. But I definitely think the Warriors have some equity in terms of we have done this before. Now we understand what we need to do, what we need to prioritize, and how do we make this work based on what we learned from last year. So I think those general situations they are kind of different yeah that's pretty fascinating because that's actually exactly what i was going to ask you because there is that um there is that interesting like there's this parallel between those three and let's chuck in the um the oakland tortata as well for for baseball who got to the point where they were like if we have to base ourselves in australia we can't afford to do that so they pulled out of their season um and then were threatened with like um having their license revoked and things like that, which is a factor to keep in mind as well when people talk about like the sacrifices that the clubs are make. It's like the clubs don't have a choice, really. Um, the players don't necessarily have to be there. We saw that with the Warriors last season. We've seen that with Rob Lowe this season. Um, there are players who have opted out of this kind of thing, but I think the clubs themselves don't really have a choice as far as their own survival goes. They're, they're in a position where, um, especially like, I think this is definitely a scale. The Warriors are the safest of them. Um, the Phoenix, though, we think of all the dramas Phoenix have had with metrics and licensing and whatever, and um, just as they get through to a point where uh, there's now an independent A-League, supposedly, and everything's a little bit safer and more secure for them if they were to have then pulled out of a season, I think that would uh, 
shake things up in a very negative way for them. There would be ramifications from the old uh, proper soccer men of Australia who would not take too kindly to that because they don't tend to take too kindly to the Phoenix in the first place. Um, and then the, uh, the, the thing with the Breakers is they haven't done this before. Um, and as you say, because of that, it was very much like, okay, you can learn from other leagues, but the NBL definitely took a long time to decide on how things were going to work. And they let things play out. There were a lot of delays. So there was even before the season started and like sacrifices therefore had to be made with going and playing in Australia and whatnot. Um, even long before that, there was uncertainty that was very, it would have been very difficult for players to deal with when this is like their livelihood. You know what I mean? Um, the Phoenix have done this before. They had the they had the little restart for a couple months um, last season to finish off that season. They um, didn't do great there. They won one out of six league games and then lost a uh, elimination final to Perth. So add in the start to this season, which is uh, what is it? One win from eight. Uh, one two three four four. One win from eight games. Um, add that to one win from seven games. You got two wins out of the last fifteen games for them. It's not not good, and it's also a reflection that this isn't just this season has come out of the like this slow start to the season hasn't just come out of the blue. It's a continuation of them not doing very well playing in Australia last season either. And I think a major factor of that has to be that this team, um, more than any of the four that that have been mentioned do actually rely on their home form a lot. Like, if you look at what happened last season, they, they, the, when I say home games, this includes at least one, uh, two, in fact, two games at Eden Park. So it's not just in Wellington. But when they've played in New Zealand, their last nine games home, including, I think, uh, where are we? One, two, three, four, five, six wins in a row. So they're on a six-game winning streak at home. That's where the bulk of their points came from last season. Like the um, the two losses that they'd had, after, they lost four in a row to start the season. So you almost got to ignore that. That was just slow starting, new coach, a lot of new players. Um, then they went on a big unbeaten streak, and then the only two losses they had before the restart were both in away games. Um, one of which in Perth, which is as away as away gets. Like they did rely a lot on ticking over points at home like they were very good at making the most of their um familiar conditions like that they don't have those familiar conditions here other teams are playing home games the phoenix are playing either away games or neutral games um some of those neutral games are in the city of the team that they're playing against like you know if they're playing a sydney team in sydney it might as well be an away game I just, I yeah, I'm just, I'm, I'm struggling not to think that that is a major factor, specifically when it comes to the Phoenix. But it's interesting that you don't think the, the Warriors will be so affected by that, because I, I tend to agree. Um, I think for one thing, like, the, the resources that they've put into all the things around, doing that, um, as you say, uh, significant. Um, also just the fact that I think the Warriors have more resources to use than the Wellington Phoenix, who, um as has been reported, that used a quite a... They, well, they were in a position where they basically had to take a uh, very, very, um, uh, say, deep um, advantage of, like, government bailout -y type things, the uh, wage subsidies and, and grants and whatnot. Um, they don't have a lot of cash running around. And I uh, a question I was asked the other day is, like, what is the comparison between, like, the Warriors who seem to be based at like a pretty nice sort of, um, what is it, like a country club or a resort or something like that? Like if they seem to have all the facilities there and whatnot. I'm not actually, it's something that I've probably let be a bit of a blind spot with the Phoenix. I'm not actually sure what their full setup is. I've got a feeling they're based at like a university or something like that. So maybe it's equivalent, like maybe it's just as good. I don't know, but it's something I'm actually thinking to have a peek at because I because uh, there's a lot more that goes into it than just playing away from home um, but yeah definitely as far as the Phoenix goes not having the ability to get their home games which you know remember for the other team they're flying to another country to play those games um, so it's as much a disadvantage for them as it is an advantage for the for the Phoenix not having that is clearly a major factor in the fact that they're struggling to get over the line in a lot of close games one thing about what the Warriors, like different from the Warriors last season to this season, 
all the dudes who were part of the Warriors NRL squad, and a lot of them did end up making their debuts, I think most except for Rocco Berry, there was no rugby league for them. Like, if you're not playing NRL, you're not playing anything. Whereas this season, if you're not, if you're part of that Warriors group and they've legit got, you've got a top 30 squad, and then I think the Warriors will have maybe 35 to 40 players all up. But this season, again, it goes back to the logistics and learning and convenience, kind of, because the Redcliffe deal was in place already. But this season, all the players surplus to NRL footy, they're going to play reserve grade for Redcliffe. And I would imagine that if you're not playing A-League footy for the Wellington Phoenix, there's nothing else for you. If you're not getting game time for the Breakers, there's nothing else for you. And that was the case for the Warriors last year. But there'll be an improvement on that this year with the relationship to um, with Redcliffe. Even younger dudes, like if you're not, if you're part of that Warriors crew over in Australia, but you're maybe 18 or 19 years old and you're not, going to be playing reserve grade because that's might not that might be a stretch for you as a development player you can play under 20s for Redcliffe which might be under 21s this season so there's those type of things like if it's your second year doing it you're going to be far better off and let alone the fact that like who's in charge of the Warriors is Cameron George I think he's from Tamworth the big man, Phil Gould, he's a big boss man. He's got connections into the NRL. Um, Nathan Brown's an Aussie who's got his own connections within Australia. So I think they have far more support within Australia than those other fr um, franchises because it's just there's just more Aussies. And more Aussies who, like Phil Gould's pretty high up in the rugby league world. So if he can use his um, power to manifest something, that's going to be good. Um, just to segue us into the boxing, and this uh, this stems off what you've said as well, like the Phoenix have to play in in the A League, the Breakers have to play. Like it's not a sacrifice; it's like for the survival type of stuff. They have to do it. Um, like all those city kickboxing UFC fighters, the thing in the UFC during like 2020, especially the UFC kept putting on fights, but it was up to you if you wanted to fight or not. So there were some fighters who didn't fight at all last year. And then there were other fighters, like a lot of the city kickboxing dudes, who had one or two fights last year. And it's a case of, well, if I don't fight, I don't make money type of situation. Like, it's your job to fight. And that's why you see all the city kickboxing fighters um, have to go through what they do. Like, Dan Hooker talked about it in an interview I was listening to this morning. Um, standard Kiwi business, like, like, no excuses, it is what it is, like, it's actually a good thing, like, they, all the city kickboxing, dealing with all the quarantines and um, adversity, like, it's just a full-on representation in New Zealand, in a classic Stephen Adams type of way, like, that sort of, sort of vibe, but it's super niggly, like, these dudes are going to fight UFC top five fights with, without their coaches in their corner. Or they're having to go over here, then catch a flight here, then quarantine there and do all this. And it's just, they just have to. Because that's their job. And it, and that's a, it's super interesting in the UFC because you either want to fight or you don't want to fight. And I think they were a bit more lenient with just the conditions around it. So if you didn't want to fight, like it wasn't like detrimental to your standing. But there's some dudes who benefited greatly from just being like, like if you're if you live in Las Vegas or if you live in California, there's no drama. Like you can take a fight as long as you're healthy as frequently as you want because you're just going to Las Vegas, or you might base yourself in the UAE because they're holding those fight island fights in the UAE and it's nothing to you. Whereas for these New Zealand fighters, it's a nightmare of a situation just to get the fight. And for these dudes, like. They just kept fighting because they had to, and it's a it's a very different situation to the adversity and the niggle that a lot of other fighters in the UFC had to deal with, just because these dudes are coming from New Zealand, um, which takes us into Junior Fan Joseph P Parker this weekend, which we have talked a bit about. So all of our discussion has kind of revolved around, um, you know, what it means, how cool it is, those type of things where. 
I want to kind of finish this episode talking about some details and maybe some stylistic and tactical elements of this fight because you have watched Joseph Parker for a long time and you mentioned how something about the the Parker perception on his power and I'm just looking at the results Joseph Parker's last three wins all came via KO or TKO up until that point he had like he had two losses Anthony Joshua and Dillian White both were unanimous decision losses and then before that his three wins were decision wins compare that to Junior Farr and his last two wins were decision and then he had two TKOs and then he had two decisions and he had a KO so it's a bit scattered there but if we just compare their their most recent fights, Joseph Parker's got KOs and TKOs, whereas Junior Farr has decisions. So is there anything in that that you see could set up how this fight plays out? Like, do either of these dudes have the power to knock each other out? Or are you expecting a 12-round kind of boxing clinic from both fighters, real slick and those type of things? How do you see this fight playing out from a from a detail standpoint one thing's for sure both fighters have said that they intend to knock out their opponent um the sort of thing that boxers say before every single fight joseph parker in particular is notorious for this so he, before every fight he's like yeah i'm planning to knock him out early rounds gonna come out firing you know etc 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 it's not what he tends to do um and I don't know if that's because he's just bluffing or if it's because he's been unable to do that or what. Um, he has got those three knockouts in his most recent. Um, do you have the names of the fighters that he's beaten, though? Uh, Alexander Flores, Alex Leopai, and Sean Dell Winters. I only semi know of Alex Leopai, Josh Papali'i's cousin or uncle, I think. Yeah, and that's not necessarily for his boxing um, standout that he's known either. It's he hasn't been fight like. So you're what you're telling me, you're telling me that those dudes aren't exactly high caliber opposition. No, um, they're not. Like it's not Anthony Joshua two point Um, it's not that they were bad boxers, but I guess what my point is is those weren't knockouts that were from Parker's overwhelming power. Those were knockouts that came from his overwhelming gap in ability. You know, like you, you just wear a guy down, he'll fall over, you hit him enough. You, it, you Like if you're that much better, you're going to get knockouts. Um, I think those were knockouts, one or two, like one or two of them were really impressive too. One or two of them weren't. Um, there can't be two of each, but... <laughs> I'd have to go back looking at highlights to refresh my memory because none of them were memorable fights. Um, and that adds into a just it's not been a particularly memorable, arguably two years really for Joseph Parker where his career has sort of stalled. He's not been getting the big fights that he should have been getting. Um, when he did get one, he got bitten by a spider. It's the way it's kind of gone for him. Um, I don't, yeah, I, I don't see him having the power to knock out Junior Far, um, unless he absolutely dominates in that same kind of way. And I mean, maybe he will. I was looking at some of the odds from overseas. The um things like Betfair had it as um like dollar ten favorite Joseph Parker, five dollar outsider Junior Far, which is a huge golf. Um just quietly, I think decent odds um on Junior Far. I'm not saying he he's certainly the underdog coming into the fight, but I don't know if he's that much of an underdog, particularly because of the old adage, you know, styles make fights and and if Parker is forced to um grind out a twelve rounder, which I'd say is probably the likelihood, um, then that's gonna be pretty interesting because we know that Junior Far is a decent fighter in that kind of situation. He's won He's obviously proved that he can win game uh, when he can win his bouts by decision. He can go the rounds and tally up the you know points on the judges' scorecards and whatnot. There has actually been a little bit of niggle about the judging scenarios. There was um, uh, just uh, something that um, the that uh, Junior Farr's manager kicked up a um, what's his name Mark Kittle um, Mark Cadell kicking up a fuss about. Some of the they they talked about it in the press conference. Um, not want like two South Auckland fellas. They kind of wanted 
reflect of Auckland judges rather than seeing like Canterbury names on there and and the way, the way that um because because Kevin Barry's from Canterbury Kevin Barry also pointed out that he hasn't lived there for 30 years so um I think it might be a little bit overblown but you also don't take chances when you're the, when you're the underdog eh? and it's one of those things that we have seen um from junior far side they've been very careful not to be exploited in ways that it would be easy to have been exploited were you not aware of these kind of situations. So as Eugene Behrman said quite hilariously in the thing, he's like, we don't want one of the judges to be Kevin Bar- Kevin Barry's mate from down the pub or anything like that. We just want to cover our bases on these situations. Um, it was inter- that was that was from the last the final press conference they did, which was quite a quite like a lot of these press conferences have actually been really fun, which I'm surprised by because. Neither Far or Parker are very... It's not that they're bad communicators. They're both quite good communicators. They're just... They're laid-back dudes in that realm. They're not um, They're not big trash talkers or anything like that. However, a lot of the camps, like the, the trainers and whatnot, have been relatively big trash talkers, and that's been where the, that's been where the funk has lied. Um, I think an aspect of Eugene Behrman's character that it's probably been out there, but it just because he's had the he's had the antagonists of um, mostly David Higgins, for example, a little bit of Kevin Barry as well, um, to aim for. He's so funny, like he, he's hilarious. I, I don't know if that's necessarily something that people have realised about him, um, but he's getting sly little digs in all the time. It's great. Um, yeah, but coming back to the power thing, I I don't see either of them. This is the this is the thing that I'm sort of stuck on because I I am going to write a preview about this fight when we finish recording. It's just like I want to be how does how does Parker win this fight? How does Far win this fight? What are the kind of game plans we're looking at? And there's as you would expect, only been hints and crumbs offered up from the camps themselves, um, and Junior Far simply hasn't fought at this level before to have a any kind of reference point. Um, Parker has had a number of fights that are sort of similar. He's used to fighting guys taller than him. Um, they've made a point of that. Um, he hasn't always looked fantastic in those fights, but it's something he's got experience of. Um, he's also used to being like... Um, it, well, he's fought in situations where he's been the underdog. He's fought in situations where he's been the guy expected to win. So a lot of this is familiar ground for him. Um, I'm interested in how the crowd will react. I I suspect what we'll get is... I don't know if Joseph Parker will come out and just be the favorite in a way that he would be if he was fighting an overseas fighter. Um, but it was, uh, he's the more recognized one, so you would expect still a bit more like coming into the fight, a bit more like buzz for him. But I also suspect that maybe because of the nature of the fight, it's just going to be one of those ones where the crowd reacts in a way where it's like they just want to see action. Whoever gets on top of the fight, that gets cheered. Um, whoever jumps into the, the clinch too often that gets booed that kind of thing um i also don't know like kiwi boxing crowds like you've got a hundred meters of um like fat cats and suits and the tables and the corporate seats before you get to the people who are going to make any real noise so i don't know um if that maybe is even going to be a factor at, at uh i think it's spark arena isn't it um but yeah as i i'm struggling to come up with ideas of how the fight is going to happen stylistically but i'm i'm pretty fascinated because i think that is a point in of itself like the fact that it's not obvious is a is a variable that we take into the fight which um is going to affect the outcome of it because whoever can get in control nice and early that's one thing both fighters did mention um or both camps rather on behalf of their fighters did mention is making sure they win the early rounds, get in front from the start. Parker wants to come out with big energy and um, throw, you know, throw some heavy punches early on. Really make a statement. Far sort of was a, sounded a bit more like they want him to just box sensibly and make sure he scores those rounds rather than going in for anything reckless and taking counters back. They'd want to make sure he gets like points on the board early on, um, and then dominate, control the fight from there. It's it's pretty fascinating stuff, but it's hard, man, to to predict exactly how these kind of things will go. I think one prediction I will make, though, coming back to the original point, is I don't think we'll see a knockout. What do we have? So what, what were the odds that you said for the foreign entity? Uh, yeah, uh, uh, yeah, I screenshotted it, so I haven't. I can't scroll down. But um, it was uh, $1.10 for Parker and $5 for Junior Far. 
So the TAB, the New Zealand TAB, has Joseph Parker at $1.12 and Junior Farr at $6. Interesting. Which, like, we don't... We don't we don't gamble, but that might be reason to start gambling. Like obviously I'm a CKB fanboy. Um and it is interesting. The um Joseph Parker KO dollar seventy five. Yeah, I'd stay clear of that one, I think. Which doesn't yeah, it doesn't seem likely to happen. Um like so so well like here's the last question. A lot of people have seen Joseph Parker fight a lot, like he is the most visible of the two fighters over the past five to ten years. What have you seen in, I don't know if you've seen too much of Junior Fire or whatever, but is there a, a, how does he fight? Does he have a style? Does he have a key weapon? Does he have, because um, he's quite a big dude as well, does he move better than other big dudes? Like what's one thing or two things about Junior Fire that you've seen in following Kiwi boxing over the last few years, that other people, the listeners who haven't seen Junior Far fight, um, was something that they need to know about Junior Far and how he operates inside the ring. I I have watched a lot of him. I'm not sure I've watched enough of him to get that kind of reflective idea though yet. Um, he's got good size. He's he can take a hit. He's there's no dramas there. Um, I wouldn't say he has the mobility of Joseph Parker, who the like his hand speed and his footwork is as good as anyone in the heavyweight division. A um, couple other aspects where he does drop down in the in the um, sort of you know the old tail of the tape. He's not as like you've got at the moment heavyweights at the top like Tyson Fury and um, Anthony Joshua, who are also like huge like extremely tall um without sacrificing power whatsoever whereas parker is shorter and not as strong so he's very quick but he doesn't necessarily hurt those guys at the very top anyway um but like there's a lesson to be learned from the way parker's career unfolded because early on he looked like a knockout artist for sure because he was dropping you know um uh fellas who perhaps should not have been in a ring with him at, on a couple of occasions but he was dropping guys on his way up constantly like consistently he was getting knockouts it was big dramatic endings to fights he was putting guys on the deck it was that's how it goes um that power dried out once he got to the sort of top couple tiers of the heavyweight division and he had to explore being like a much better boxer like the science of boxing he had to be tactically better and he did very well in a lot of those things those fights tend to be a bit more um, people see what they want to see often when the when talking about boxing. So you get people who argue that he lost to Ruiz, people who argue even that he lost to Huey Fury, which is crazy, but whatever. Um, not having seen that from Junior Farr is interesting, but I think Junior Farr's also gone through a career path which is very different to Parker's, who spent most of his time fighting in New Zealand for big crowds um, under the Juco banner. Junior Farr's been through a couple different, like he's represented by Lou DiBella at the moment, but he's been through a couple other ones. I think he was on, um, um, oh, what's that dude's name? Heyman or whatever. I think he was on that card, uh, on like working for on his books for a little while, um, Al Heyman. Uh, he has fought a lot overseas um, in quite difficult scenarios. Though, like those are not easy fights to win necessarily when you're away from home. Um on the undercard somewhere you're not going to get a lot of protection you're not necessarily like going to get a much of a reputation like that's i think some of his fights have, well I'll, I'll say this his first however many fights that he's uh, what is he uh 19 and no i'll say his first 19 fights try or well, uh, uh, i don't know actually when joseph parker would have fought carlos to come but they're up to that point like say that this is the point in his career where parker fought to come um up to that point i think junior Farr's had a much tougher road than Parker did getting there. Um, but also, as we learned from Parker, what happened before that point and what happened after that point doesn't necessarily correlate. Um, different aspects of, of your style come through at higher levels. And so we just haven't seen that from Junior Far. Um, he looks in great shape. He looks in his... The last couple of years, I think there's been like a a big leap for him. He, he didn't seem... I won't say he was ever an unserious fighter, but he... he certainly got to the point within the last two or three years where he took a big leap um athletically and that's how you know that's led that's also 
coincided not co- it's not a coincidence but for the sake of not having a thesaurus coincided with him shooting up the rankings like winning some big fights not big fights that people necessarily know about but the kinds that get you on the edge of the scene to where he's able to get those fights so um how that works against a, a higher ranked opponent will we can only find out but um he yeah he he should have um he should move fairly well for a guy his size, not as well as Parker, but better than most his size. Um, don't know that he's got crazy knockout strength, but I suspect he's probably a little bit more powerful than Parker is. Um, won't have the hand speed, but he is a very good boxer, and he does have the size advantage over Parker. He's an inch or two taller than him. He'll be heavier than him as well. So there's definitely a few things that do lean in Far's, um, in Far's uh, corner as far as, like, the way the the fight will shape out, and Junior Far's last three fights were all, all in Australia. So going back to like the one of the earlier points I made, those decision wins in his last two fights they seem like just really solid results. Like the it seems like their their whole careers are just flipped against each other. Um, with and Junior Far like Joseph Parker had those fights early on, and then Junior Far had the tough you know, fights in America, get a couple of decision wins, just get those fights under your belt. Like, it didn't seem like he needed to, like, the objective was to get some big KO wins or TKO wins. Like, it seems like in 2019, especially, it was just about getting some higher level experience and being there. And one last thing here, Wildcard. Junior Far, on the 22nd of June, 2018, he defeated Lewis Pasquale, Mexican dude, by decision. The location of this win was the Mahatma Gandhi Center in Auckland. So that's pretty cool. He's he's had a scrap in the Mahatma Gandhi Center. Yeah, I don't even know what to say to that. Where's the Mahatma Gandhi Center? Um, somewhere in Auckland. Somewhere Those in outside Auckland, Auckland yeah. wouldn't give a shit. So, um, you know, it's just a center in Auckland that hosts events so shout out to that right we'll wrap it up there that's all good good work good mahi um oh it's gonna it's a, this takes us into a very interesting time for combat sports and as i said at the, the start of the show there's a lot all the other big sports are coming back around so it's pretty hectic this period where it's like the end of the cricket a lot of cricket happening then everything else starting it's a beautiful time to be alive so kia ka stay beautiful choo choo